Hello and welcome to our webinar, Artificial Intelligence Transforming the Workplace. Uh, and to those of you who tuned in last time, I trust you've had uh, an apology because of Lexology. We are back on the brink. Uh, apologies for those technical issues. Uh, I'm Mark from the data protection team here at Bristos, and I am delighted to be joining uh, two of my colleagues in uh, from our employment and immigration team, uh, Emily. Hello, Emily. Hi, Mark. Uh, and Gareth. Hello, Gareth. Hi, Mark. Hello, all. Uh, welcome. Uh, we uh, have a packed agenda for you, which is coming up on our slides now. Uh, there are three key topics that we want to cover. The core focus is the first one on the slide there, which is the use um, of artificial intelligence um, in HR tools. Um, so so uh, that's our sort of core focus uh, for the session. Uh, then a second one, we're going to look at um, workplace transformation a bit, a bit more briefly. Uh, and then finally, uh, generative AI at work as used uh, by the workers, by employees, uh, chat GPT uh, and the rest of it, which is in fact transformed. Uh, our workplaces uh, discuss over the last uh, 12 months or so. Um, so we've got two uh, areas of uh, law, employment law, data protection law, uh, and we're going to try and see how much common ground there is in, in tackling uh, artificial intelligence. A bit of scene setting perhaps, just what, what do we all actually mean by artificial intelligence? Well, the House of Commons uh, research briefing on artificial intelligence and employment law uh, gives us a ready-made definition. It, it defines artificial intelligence as technologies that enable computers to simulate elements of human intelligence, uh, such as perception, learning, and reasoning. Um, what does that mean then if we sort of think of it in terms, perhaps we put it another way of how traditional computer programming works as compared to this artificial intelligence thing. Perhaps the distinguishing feature between those two is artificial intelligence's ability to learn from data inputs and adapt over the course of time. So that means in the employment context that algorithms, for example, trained on large amounts of employment related data can then be used to make inferences about uh, employees or candidate skills, their abilities, their productivity, and that in turn can then be used as the basis for hiring, uh, for managing employees, or indeed ultimately for firing decisions. Um, and so if we start thinking about some use cases, some specific examples, and these tools, by the way, we'll talk about some of them um, by name, but for now I just want to sort of get the categories in there, I know Emily will expand on this, but just in terms of what they are. You can imagine, uh, and indeed they already exist, um, CV screening tools facilitated by HR uh, that can help uh, HR uh, to sift through uh, pools of candidates where there are large numbers of resumes or CVs involved. Um, performance management tools, uh, which might have the potential to reduce um, bias by taking human prejudices out of the equation. Um, you uh, have already got uh, tools that are helping us to write um, job descriptions and in doing so help to eliminate the use of biased language. Uh, for example, um, uh, you know, when we're trying to attract as diverse a pool of job applicants as possible, we might want to remove certain words, energetic or dynamic, which might tend to appeal to younger applicants and make older applicants less uh, inclined uh, to apply uh, for a certain sort of job that they see as, as requiring a skill that they might feel uh, that they don't have enough of. Um, uh, and then we can see there's video pre-screening uh, used to pre-screen candidates in uh, uh, recruitment processes. There are all sorts of tools out there. As I say, we can talk a bit more about those uh, in a moment. Um, I want to say a word about the promise versus the pitfalls of artificial intelligence um, in, in the workplace. And, and perhaps just going back to what I said a moment ago, the simplest way to encapsulate that might be to think about, um, if we think about their promise uh, and think about good old humans, 
uh, with their biases, uh, their prejudices, uh, their flaws, their proclivities. Uh, that is the stuff I assume uh, uh, Gareth and, and Emily, uh, you know, takes up at least some of their time um, uh, in all manner of disputes that happen in the workplace as a result of uh, those all too human uh, characteristics that I've just described. So artificial intelligence certainly gives us the promise of, of greater objectivity uh, in the field of recruitment or performance management of employees, giving more consistent feedback, less prejudice feedback, uh, and indeed ultimately if there's a decision to, to terminate or a redundancy scenario or, or something like this. Um, at the same time, of course, that depends very heavily on some of the inputs, what goes into the algorithm. And in fact, of course, there's uh, increasing evidence about the amplification of human bias as a result of artificial intelligence tools. And I know, Emily, you're going to talk more about that. Um, at the same time, uh, theoretically, um, the reasoning process um, is, is one that you ought to be able to recreate uh, quite well with humans. It doesn't always work out that way. And conversely, one might argue with artificial intelligence, that is a bit of a black box. The process is not always well known, even to the developer of the tool in question. The process I mean by which it reaches a decision. And artificial intelligence, of course, is co-relative rather than causative. It's, it's making assumptions and it's looking at patterns. And indeed, the law uh, has a lot to say about the circumstances in which uh, that, that is permissible and provides a, a whole framework um, about all of that. So um, th that's um, a very high level indeed um, uh, uh, sort of comparison of, of some of the promise and some of the pitfalls. The last one I should have mentioned, of course, is the efficiency and the speed, of course, of, of artificial intelligence tools. That's important in any situation when you've got lots of uh, lots of data to get through. Um, I know, Gareth, you've got a lot to say about that topic as well. But before we get to that, do you just want to say something about um, artificial intelligence and the transformation of the workplace? Sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think the how, where and when we work has always been shaped by technology. So new technologies, they naturally create efficiencies, they bring improvements to all walks of our lives, not least our working lives. And over hundreds of years, really, the workplace working practices and the law and regulation governing those working practices has adapted and evolved largely in response to technological developments. A lot of those are all quite gradual and natural. Sometimes it's quite difficult to identify that inflection point for change but occasionally we have these more seismic developments which transform the way we work dramatically and very swiftly um going back a while we had the industrial revolution that brought machines it brought factories and that resulted in quick and dramatic shifts in efficiencies and outputs well ai looks set to do something similar you know it's basically empowering one to do the work of many and it's perhaps not surprising that it has uh, itself been compared to the Industrial Revolution. It is the ultimate change program, and many commentators have described it as Industrial Revolution 4.0. Um, are we seeing that yet, though? Are we getting towards that inflection point? Um, you know, we've been hearing that a robot might take our job headline for many years now, uh, and we've all seen the reports and headlines which suggests that AI could replace as many as 300 million uh, full-time jobs worldwide. That, of course, remains to be seen. You know, at this stage, um, when I speak to Mark and Emily in terms of clients that we're advising or just people we're speaking to generally, we're not necessarily seeing situations where jobs are being directly replaced by AI. Um, but I think it's fair to say that it's rare to speak to anyone uh, whose role or way of working has not in some way uh, been touched by AI already. Um, and it's reaching out across all industries and sectors, and it is transforming the where, when, and how we work. Um, the opportunities and benefits for both employers and employees are hugely exciting. 
Um, but clearly they come with a multitude of complex risks, challenges, considerations, be they legal, social, operational, philosophical uh, or moral. We, we'll touch on some, possibly all of those uh, considerations during the course of the session today um, and perhaps in further sessions to come as this, this topic develops. Um, so let, let, let's kick off. Let, let's perhaps hand over to Emily who can start talking to us about how AI is being used in HR tools and that sort of context of managing uh, the workforce. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Thanks, Gareth. Um, so as Mark has mentioned, there are already a significant number of HR tools on the market that utilise some form of AI to assist HR teams and managers with the recruitment process and day-to-day -day employee management. Uh, according to statistics from the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, 68% of large companies in the UK and 15% of all UK businesses had adopted at least one form of AI solution by January last year. And these tools have the potential to improve productivity as well as the recruitment um, and line management experience for employees, and for their managers and HR. But as well as the huge potential, there are also significant risks for employers to think about. Um, and the, these are risks that have already been recognized in a number of other jurisdictions. For example, the EU's draft regulation, the AI Act, um, has identified recruitment and performance management as high risk uses of AI and New York City recently introduced laws placing audit and transparency obligations on employers using AI in the workplace. So as most listeners um, of this webinar will probably know, there's currently no AI specific legislation applicable in the UK. However, employers here are still bound by the rules and obligations under our existing legal framework which can undoubtedly be applied to the use of AI in the workplace. So today um, I'm going to talk through three of the key legal considerations for employers to think about um, when using AI in the workplace as an HR tool. So that's firstly, the employer's duty of trust and confidence. Secondly, the risk of discrimination. And thirdly, the unfair dismissal risk. And Mark um, is going to cover off um, the data protection considerations. And I think now, um, Mark, you've got um, a real example of how candidates are responding to the use of these HR tools in practice. Uh -huh. Yes, thank you, Emily. I mean, we've all got our own perspective on this. And it does seem to me, and this is anecdotal, but uh, you know, people entering the job market and um, perhaps for the first time or, or in the early stages are certainly on the front line of a lot of the tests that um, we're talking about, um, which are AI enabled. Um, so I'm thinking about online assessments. I was talking to a group of 20 somethings um, very recently and they said, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you want to know? We know about these tools. Um, yes, we've, and one of them then started to reel off um, a number of anecdotes. He'd uh, applied for some quite reputable city jobs. Uh, they're using a number of these tools and he said yeah one of them was it's clearly a sort of resilience uh, type of tool you just have to keep on plugging away at it on your laptop uh, anyway long story short i am sitting at the kitchen student kitchen table with uh, several of my mates i just passed my laptop around uh, on the same test live uh we all had a go uh and uh then i closed the assessment and um that, that was that. He got the job, he got some feedback, which was what an interesting diversity of styles he'd used to get through this online assessment. Uh, I, I have to say I laughed out loud. Um, but what did strike me about that is that the way in which these tools are being deployed is as important in some respects, the environment in which they're deployed is as important in some respects as the actual technology itself and it, it did strike me of some some employers would say well, that, that's cheating it's implied that one person should be taking the test but as i say it didn't make me laugh i mean they, they were just using their initiative to say that anywhere and it's a numbers game for the it is for the employer with with too many applications to sift through 
think it is for the candidates as well in many cases. Um, anyway, enough about that. Thanks, Mark. So um, going back to the law and um, the first potential employment law risk of using AI as an HR tool um, is the, the consideration of the duty of trust and confidence. So in every employment relationship, there is an implied mutual duty of trust and confidence between employee and employer. And an employer's failure to comply with this duty can result in both breach of contract and constructive unfair dismissal claims from employees. So what, what does this have to do with AI? Well, <clears throat> if an employer begins to rely on AI to make or greatly influence its performance management decisions, then employees may lose this crucial trust and confidence in their employer. In particular, the use of AI will make it hard, if not impossible, for employers to explain or justify management decisions, such as those relating to performance, for example. And of course, this is going to have an impact on the trust that an employee has in their employer. So this is the, the issue is because the development of AI tools is so complex and involves a number of different parties, such as those supplying the training data, those that write the code, and those that determine what the AI system should be used for. Um, this makes it incredibly difficult for any one person, let alone a manager or HR professional, to explain its outputs. There's also mental health and well-being issues to consider when using AI as an HR tool. So taking the human element of management out of the equation and removing the day-to-day -day interaction and rapport employees hopefully have with their managers uh, may cause stress and anxiety for employees. And this failure to look after employee well-being could also amount to a breach of trust and confidence. So what should employers think about um, when implementing AI in the workplace? Well, firstly, um, when it comes to using HR tools, they should be transparent about when and how these um, AI systems are being used within the business um, and ensure that there is an appropriate level of human oversight and continued, continued monitoring of outcomes. Um, employers also need to make sure that they train the relevant HR professionals or managers on how these tools work because they likely won't have had to use them before in their career um, and also you know give a clear warning about um, the risks of relying solely on these tools to make decisions. Thanks Emily I think those are practical steps which will really help preserve trust and confidence but also mitigate the risk of grievances and other employee relation type claims or complaints. We'll, we'll come back to the discrimination considerations in a moment I just want to bring in Mark to get your take on the importance of transparency in the data protection perspective. Yeah, thank you, Gareth. Um, I think that's an area of common ground, uh, as I read it anyway, coming from the data protection side uh, towards uh, the employment law framework um, in the UK, and I, I would wager further afield in, in Europe. So we just got on, on the slide here. This, this is part of the thread that runs through the, the GDPR, that these are the or transparency articles, um, so-called transparency, because at the heart of um, the opportunity to exercise a data protection right, that, that it has to be preceded by um, um, transparency. If you don't know about uh, the processing of your data, there's not very much you can do to exercise your rights. Um, you don't know that you have them. Um, and that came through very loud and clear from, from what you were just saying, Emily. So <clears throat> articles 13 and 14, the core transparency right. And, and if you look at the bottom half of the slide, it, it talks about the, I'm gonna say something about what automated decision-making is later, but in the context of the use of automated decision-making, so AI tools for these purposes, um, at least in those cases, you need to use meaningful information about the logic involved, as well as the significance and the envisaged consequences of that processing for the data subject, the candidate, the employee, whatever, and, and recital 60 and be the GDPR. 
from that, I'm going to submit good principles-based way, which is which is quite um, flexible, not prescriptive. Says that you should also provide any further information that's necessary to ensure fair uh, and transparent process. And again, uh, the use of that term fair, which is a term of art in data protection terms. And we are already starting to see in the case law um, and in guidance, uh, albeit in particular from the European Data Protection Board, which of course is technically not legally binding in the UK, but nevertheless persuasive. We're starting to see some interpretation of, of what all of that means, um, uh, that, that language uh, that's on the screen in the statute. Um, and here's a spoiler coming up. None of the case law or the data protection authority decisions are talking about mathematical explanations being necessary. Spoiler alert, none of them are talking about access to algorithms being the heart of what you as an HR person need to bone up on and, and get skilled in. And final spoiler alert, none of them are talking about um, the need for detailed information about computing systems or operating, operating systems or, or how those things work. And I think that's really important to grasp from an HR perspective, that they're talking about things like, well, what are the categories of data that, that are going to be used in this automated decision-making process? Why are those categories of data pertinent for this particular process that you're going through rather than some different categories? How broadly is any profile that's going to be used in that automated decision making actually built? As I say, not from a technical perspective, but just what, what are the moving parts of that from a business logic perspective? And how is this going to be used for a decision about the employee? Is this the final step of that process? Is it an earlier step? What is it? So the takeaway, I think, from, from an HR perspective um, is that I think you would want very much to be involved in the procurement or the design process of, of any um, artificial intelligence tools that are going to be used in any aspect of, of the, I'm going to use this in the broadest sense, the HR process. Um, when it comes to explaining the, the meaningful logic as the uh, or the meaningful information about the logic, I beg your pardon, um, in the law, you should be ready, actually, I think, to, to help write this section of the employee handbook or the rules and the interview or whatever the process is. Um, you should at least be aware um, that the ICO is already of its own volition starting to look specifically at AI pro providers in, in the workspace, so in employment use cases. Um, and of course, I mentioned that anecdote about candidates and how they're reacting to the deployment of these tools. Um, these are things that you'll want to factor in uh, uh, to your decision when you when you make that decision to deploy um, AI-enabled tools. Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, so I think it's clear that the data protection and employment law considerations all tie in well, um, which brings me on to the second um, employment law consideration that we're going to cover today in relation to HR tools, um, which is discrimination. And whilst Mark talked earlier about one of the potential benefits of using AI, to assist with HR functions as being the elimination of human bias. This is, of course, the optimum outcome. And what we need to think about as well is the high risk that AI will in fact perpetuate and potentially magnify existing human biases, particularly um, if left unmonitored, as, as Mark alluded to. So, so why is this? Well, um, AI works by learning from existing data so if that existing data reflects historic human biases or stereotypes, which it inevitably will, then the AI system is going to learn to replicate these biases and stereotypes. For example, an AI system may learn that men are more likely to succeed in a senior role within a company because historically more men have held such senior positions. The AI is then likely to prefer male candidates and perpetuate that human bias that existed to begin with. 
And this did actually happen um, when Amazon sought to develop its own recruitment tool back in uh, 2014. So that's one point to consider. And then there's also the unconscious biases of the AI programmers who um, are probably not going to be experts on discrimination law. And the engineers who design the algorithms and set the goals of the AI system may well be influenced by their own personal views or prejudices without even realising um, and not thinking about the employment law risks that could arise when the AI tool is eventually implemented. Another consideration um, in respect of discrimination is the use of AI in video interviews has actually been found to disadvantage neurodivergent applicants, for example, those with autism or ADHD, who might find it difficult to maintain eye contact or find it hard to converse without there being visual or or cues to pick up from another human. <clears throat> However, some of these individuals have actually said they prefer video interviews and find them less anxiety inducing than in-person interviews. So there's definitely a potential for AI, if developed and implemented carefully, to be a positive for neurodivergent candidates who are currently severely underrepresented in the workplace. So if an employee or a potential employee were to identify bias in an AI system, they may well succeed in bringing an indirect discrimination claim on the basis that the relevant AI algorithm was a provision, criterion or practice, um, which puts those with a protected characteristic at a particular disadvantage. It may well be that the AI is no more biased than the manager who would otherwise have made the employment decision. But if the employer cannot provide a non-discriminatory explanation for the decision, then the employee's claim will succeed if the employer can't objectively justify its decision. And the issue for employers here is that they are likely using AI tools that they don't fully understand and are therefore unlikely to be able to give such an explanation. There is also a chance that employees or applicants may succeed in bringing successful direct discrimination claims um, if an AI system directly prefers those with a particular protected characteristic to those um, without or vice versa. So what should employers do? Firstly, do their research. Um, ask questions of AI providers to understand what steps that, that the provider has taken to avoid discriminatory outcomes. Once a decision has been made to go with a particular provider, a particular tool, then the employer should be continually monitoring its outputs for any potential discriminatory patterns. And this is particularly important as it won't it won't be as easy to spot bias in an AI tool as it would be, for example, in a human manager. Um, when it comes to other human beings, we might pick up on a person's choice of language or their use of a certain <coughs> phrase, which indicates that the person has certain prejudices. But of course, we can't we can't do that with AI, which then makes it harder to identify biases embedded in in the AI system. Again, ensuring there is a sufficient level of human oversight and no recruitment or management decisions are made by AI alone is also important. Um, and this is also um, important from a data protection perspective, um, as Mark is, is going to speak to very shortly. However, as things currently stand, until there is greater regulation that imposes um, more strenuous uh, transparency obligations, in reality, unless employers are open about their use of AI, um, it's, it's often going to be unlikely that an employee would know that an AI tool had been used in the first place, let alone that it had generated discriminatory outcomes. Um, but we'll move on to discuss uh, future regulation later. Thanks, Emily. Just just one other thing worth mentioning, actually, in terms of practical steps we see employers take, and indeed we, we support a number of employers with, and that's the quality impact assessments. You know, that's essentially an evidence-based approach. It's designed to help organisations ensure that their policies, practices, their decision-making processes and the tools they use to inform those decision-making processes are fair and that they don't present barriers uh, to participation or disadvantage uh, any protected groups from participation and and they're not too dissimilar i suppose to data protection impact assessments which i'm, I'm sure mark will touch on 
uh, during the course of uh, his slots. Yeah, thank you, Gareth. That is another bit of common ground that strikes me. I mean, you talk about um, quality impact assessments being an evidence-based tool um, that, that employers can use. And it, it does, you know, listening to you, that it strikes me immediately that, um, and I'm going to make a plug here for uh, uh, my pet's subject, uh, data protection law, um, it, it's, it's often obviously characterised as the villain of the piece, uh, very long, very dull, uh, not intuitive, uh, difficult to understand, um, so on and so forth. Um, but actually, I think just like that equality impact assessment that, that you just mentioned, Gareth, the, the data protection impact assessment, we've, we've had that on a long that mandatory basis for a very long time. In, in data protection circles is, is now under GDPR as a mandatory tool in, in some situations. And it's a similar uh, creature in, in uh, broad terms to what you're describing in that it's an evidence-based assessment as well. Uh, and and its, its purpose is, is to allow the, in this context, the employer at design stage or um, before implementation to think about what safeguards in this context from a data protection perspective might mitigate some of the risks of deployment of, of a given uh, AI tool. So it strikes me that, that um, as far as existing law goes, in this case data protection law, we, we actually already have some tools that might help employers who are looking to deploy uh, automated decision making or trying actually to decide whether they, they do want an automated um, process. Of course, you're going to have to give some thought to do I want, um, and I'm speaking now just about DPIA is the data protection side of this, not the quality impact assessment, but you're going to have to decide do I think that's okay for that to be a disclosable document or do I think, you know, this is a bit sensitive and we might be seeking to try to protect it under legal privilege. That's that's a topic for another day, and that's that's a tactical choice. But but the tool is there. Of course, I haven't said anything about the the, the, the triggers themselves for um, a DPIA, albeit I would note, and this is neatly leading me on to the second bit of what I want to say here. One of them is um, prefigured in in Article Thirty Five of the GDPR, the Data Protection Impact Assessment, is is triggered by automated decision making. So what without further ado, what, what do we actually mean by that? And this is a again a provision that we've had for a very long time, not in this form, but for a very long time in data protection law. And it's it's changed slightly in the GDPR, but we we've got it on the screen there. And uh, I won't give you too much of the history other than to say that that first um, uh, a paragraph on the screen that we're looking at is is and has been the subject of a great deal of debate. Is this a prohibition or isn't it? And, and Europe was kind of split down the middle on this. It seems to me that, and this is, I think, fair to say, the prevailing view now that this is a prohibition. The data subject should have the right not to be subject to a decision based solely on automated processing, including profiling which produces legal effects concerning him or her or similarly significantly affects him or her. Uh, and then, of course, there's a exemption right underneath um, the circumstances in which that won't apply, um, that, that prohibition as I've termed it. The first one of those exemptions is that the deployment of the ABM, if I can call it that, the automated decision making is, is necessary for entering into or performing a contract between the employee or prospective employee um, and the prospective employer. And uh, the second one is um, perhaps a little bit abstract, but there's got to be some, in this case, uh, uh, UK law, uh, which applies to the employer and which lays down some safeguards for the use of this technology. And alternatively, um, uh, you, you avoid the application of the exemption if um, your use is based on the data subject's explicit consent. A quick word there on explicit, that is doing some heavy lifting uh, in that provision. It's not any old consent, it's got to be uh, something more than that. Uh, there's reams of guidance and case law on what that means, um, and it's a very high standard. Uh, query whether in the employment context 
it's going to be appropriate at all in very many situations. The best view, of course, is that because of that imbalance of, of power relations between employer and employee, I'm, I'm glad that uh, uh, Gareth and Emily are nodding, uh, uh, it's usually uh, not appropriate as a lawful basis. So if we just dissect briefly um, that prohibition in, in Article 22, there's, there's three moving parts to it. There has to be a decision. It has to be based solely on automated processing and it has to produce legal effects. And I suppose we can sort of knock out two of them for today's purposes quite quickly, but we are very interested in producing more material on this and potentially podcasts and so on. So we'd love to hear questions or feedback about, you know, any aspects of what we're talking about. But it does seem to us that certainly this is one of the current moving parts of the legal framework, um, which is really quite useful for artificial intelligence tools in the workplace. Um, so it produces legal effects concerning the employee or prospective employee. I think that one in very many employment contexts is quite easy to, to hit that condition. Um, you're hiring someone, you're firing them, you're making a choice about whether they go into a redundancy process. It's, it strikes me, and Gareth and Emily can jump in if they disagree, but it strikes me that all of those are going to hit that threshold. Um, the other one, the, the first of the three, there has to be a decision on, 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 on the back of everything. And I think that one is worth just thinking about the way we, those protection lawyers talk about things is as a processing operation. So what, what do I mean by that? But suppose you have a, a pre-screening process where you sort a bunch of people into different categories. Um, if on its own, that sorting is going to produce that legal effect. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about David Brent in the office. Maybe I shouldn't be. Remember that scene where he says, I really hate unlucky people, and he drops a pile of CDs in the bin. Awful example. That is a decision, quite obviously. But you can imagine in a process that has several steps in it, that pre-selecting one group of individuals from another could be a decision in its own right if it if it has a consequence for them, maybe not quite as dramatic as that one. So it seems to me that where quite a big bit of a battleground will be, and one can see some employers um, are already reacting to this, is, is the condition in the middle that it has to be based solely on the automated processing. And certainly in continental Europe, we're starting to get a uh, a, a bit of case law about this now, um, less so um, at the moment uh, in the UK, it's, it's sort of slowly coming through, but it raises the question, what counts as human intervention then? Um, can I just put a person on the end of this process, untrained, unqualified, who will just be, that's my human intervention, and now I've sidestepped the prohibition, but it seems that's not gonna, that's not gonna cut it. Um, and what the courts and the data protection authorities and their decisions have been doing around Europe is really interesting because they're starting to look at what's the level of authority uh, of, of, of the, this human intervention. So in other words, they're asking questions about what's your organizational structure? What are your reporting lines? The second thing they're doing, and, and again, I think this is a, the practical point for HR professionals to take note of is What's the level of training of, of that person? And remember what I said earlier, this is not about mathematical explanations. It's not about um, uh, the, the inner workings of the computing system being deployed. This is just about competence to understand in broad terms, how is the AI doing its, its thing? And the human intervention for it to be effective from the perspective of the European data protection authorities here. And I, I think the ICO is broadly aligned with this idea, is, is that that human intervention has to be competent and it has to have a requisite level of authority. Um, so merely specifying the parameters in which the AI is going to operate, you know, at a very generic level, it seems to me it is not going to cut it. Um, so there you have it. Um, the takeaways for, for HR, just think, think about um, how you're 
provider has has constructed the automated decision making from the perspective of, of some of the things we've been talking about and i think be involved in that procurement or that design process and as i was saying earlier think about whether a, a data protection impact assessment might actually help you rather than being sort of an obstacle uh, to getting under the skin of of um how uh, an automated decision making tool works um that's quite enough for me uh and again back to emily yeah <clears throat> back to me thanks mark um yeah i think the automated decision point um ties in quite nicely with the final topic that um i'm going to talk about from an hr tool perspective which is unfair dismissal and i think we've never advise employers to have an AI um, system make any kind of automatic decision when it comes to um, dismissal decisions. Um, so similar considerations apply to those that I've spoken about um, and Mark's touched on um, in relation to discrimination um, when it comes to making dismissal decisions such as those in a redundancy scenario. Clearly, if an employer can't justify or explain uh, a dismissal decision, um, then it's going to be difficult to prove that that decision was in the range of reasonable responses and therefore successfully defend any um, unfair dismissal claim. Um, a real life example of, um, of these issues arose when <clears throat> the AI tool Hiveview was used um, by the beauty company Estee Lauder as part of a redundancy process uh, and this was um, reported on um, by the BBC. So Estee Lauder asked um, its makeup artists whose roles were at risk of redundancy to undergo video interviews using the HireVue platform as part of as part of the selection process. Um, the three makeup artists that were eventually chosen um, Essay Lauder were unable to explain to them the basis on which their roles had been selected um, for redundancy, um, despite the fact that they had otherwise excellent employee records. The claims were eventually settled out of court, but um, so we don't know the full details, but they're a great example of, of the risks of using AI um, in making employment decisions that can have such a significant impact on, on people's lives. And interestingly, actually, after that higher view, um, removed the facial analysis um, function uh, complained about uh, in back in 2020. Um, shall I hand over to Gareth um, to discuss our next topic of workplace transformation, unless Mark, you want to jump in with anything else? Oh, um, I can't resist saying something about uh, <laughs> view. Um, and I guess everyone knows this, and I should be careful to repeat what, what uh, Emily just said about visual analysis. Um, it hasn't been used in higher view, we understand, since um, sometime in 2020, shortly after that case that, that you were describing, Emily. But yeah, just do, just do a, any random online search. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, YouTube videos uh, on how to hack uh, the higher view interview. And I, I do think, you know, uh, from an employer's perspective, it's worth having a look at those. I mean, uh, just that random 34 finance role higher view interview questions, brackets with answers, how to ace higher view interviews. I found a way to view higher view interview questions before dot, 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 what? Of course, you would have clicked through and read the next thing. There's a whole Reddit community called Recruiting Hell, uh, which seems to be quite a lot about um, that particular tool. It's not the only one that works in a similar way. And I think, you know, you're just, I'm fascinated by that case because it, it seems, from what I can understand, that, you know, if you have an algorithm that's there to look at your speech, your words, your tone of voice, pauses in your diction, uh, your body language, and things like this, um, You've got to be thinking as an employer, what, what's that actually, is that is that appropriate for the nature of the role? And it strikes me from what you're describing about that case, Emily, I'm kind of like, yeah. how does that fit in there? Does it seem like a very useful really. tool for assessing makeup artists' skills as makeup artists? Okay, let, let's move away from looking at um, AI specifically in relation to HR tools. And 
look at it through a broader lens, really, in terms of how um, evolving AI really does have the potential to transform the workplace. And I said at the beginning of the session, new, new technologies have always created efficiencies, um, which ultimately bring improvements to our lives, both inside and outside of work. However, there is this pervading sense of concern as to how AI may impact the workforce, and in particular, the, the composition of the workforce. You know, it's been described as the ultimate change program. And so almost by definition, that does mean that the impact on the current composition of the workforce, workforce is going to be significant. And it's inevitable that some existing roles will be replaced by AI in their entirety, whilst many others will need to evolve as certain tasks within those roles are replaced. It's likely that roles will need to continually adapt and evolve in line with generative AI tools, which themselves evolve through machine learning. And so it's not so straightforward as having a specific implementation date for change. That makes ensuring legal compliance a bit more difficult, you know, and it is vital for employers to understand their legal requirements and obligations, and crucially, when those requirements and obligations are triggered. Um, Early and strategic planning is required to enable you to map the changes you're proposing against the relevant legal requirements. And that's particularly relevant where we're looking at a redundancy situation. So transformational change will almost always result in some form of restructure or reorganization of the workforce as efficiencies are generated. But where those efficiencies result in the employer having a reduced requirement for employees to carry out work of a particular kind, then we've got a redundancy situation. And if those redundancies are on a large scale, collective consultation is likely to be required. And that gives rise to the tricky question that we often grapple with as to when that obligation to consult is triggered. In the UK, the obligation tends to be triggered where the employer is proposing to dismiss 20 or more employees within a 90 day period. Under the European Collective Redundancy Directive, the obligation kicks in where 20 or more dismissals are contemplated. In either case, the requirement to consult is triggered before the employer makes a decision or does something that is gonna make redundancies inevitable. And therefore that consultation does need to con 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 start really, or is triggered at a fairly formative stage. If we apply that to um, an AI scenario, you know, when will the obligation to consult be triggered? Is it following a trial of an AI tool at the point at which the employer has looked at the tool and they've identified the efficiencies that it's going to generate, and in particular, the reduction in headcount that might flow from those efficiencies? Or does it need to be even earlier than that? You know, does it need to be at the point where the employer is entering into a commercial agreement or negotiations around an agreement uh, to, to purchase an AI tool that could impact the composition of its workforce. Those are pretty tricky questions to answer and ultimately it's an area that is going to develop through case law and potentially through legislation. It's also going to vary from country to country and that creates a further challenge uh, where you're an employer that has an international workforce. But what is clear um, is that a business has got to be aware of the potential for AI to impact on its workforce. And it needs to be thinking at that, about that at a very, a very early stage. Um, that needs to be balanced against the argument that the impact on existing roles may not be immediately apparent. You know, as we mentioned earlier, many changes may sort of evolve over time and therefore we won't necessarily have that set uh, implementation or effective date for the change. So redundancy is obviously the worst case scenario for employees, but what, what do we need to think about when um, in respect of employees whose roles will continue to be required but are just going to potentially look very different? Yeah, I think it's a fair point, Emily. I think redundancy is always the, the sort of headline concern, isn't it? But actually what is perhaps going to be more prevalent is that roles will evolve or adapt as opposed to being wholly replaced. 
And so where many roles remain, but tasks within those roles are replaced or changed, then it can still give rise to legal considerations. You know, in some cases we might be looking at contractual changes. You know, is there a change to contractual terms relating to job titles, duties, reporting line, uh, etc. And employers will need to consider how best to affect those changes. You know, will they seek express consent or will they rely on implied consent? If consent isn't forthcoming, are they going to take a more nuclear option of dismissing and offering re-engagement on the revised terms? But as with a pure redundancy situation, the need to identify what level of consultation is required, who that consultation should be with and when it should take place is going to be really important. I think in any change programme, but especially a transformative one, the timing and substance of stakeholder engagement is really important. You know, AI, as we've said, it absolutely has the potential to improve our working lives. It should make many tasks easier or less repetitive, for example. But the fact is that robots will take our job headline is not entirely without substance. And so as a result, we are going to have employees that are worried about this. And where you've got employees that are worried about it, you typically will get resistance from trade unions, representative bodies, uh, or works councils or similar. So when and how you engage with those groups is going to be a crucial consideration. And you will need a strategic approach to that stakeholder engagement right from the outset. That will help mitigate the legal risks, uh, but also it will help preserve trust and confidence, which Emily touched on earlier, and it will mitigate some broader uh, industrial employee relations uh, risks. And I mentioned earlier, the process can be even more complex where a change programme is being rolled out across multiple jurisdictions where you've got an international workforce. In those circumstances, the legal requirements in each jurisdiction are going to need to be considered and complied with. And so it's vital that global businesses will have an overarching plan and a timetable which takes account of local law and practice and also what's happening on the ground in that particular country. Is there a works council? Is there a trade union? If so, What's the relationship like with them? What's the history with them? Are they generally collaborative or are they generally uh, resistant? Because this could be a lengthy process if you don't get those sort of representative bodies or groups on side or supportive. And that needs to be factored in at that early stage of your planning and procurement process. Um, few key messages, I think, just, just on this topic. Consider the workforce and impact, consider the associated legal obligations very early on in the process. Can't emphasize that enough, you know, right at that point where you're looking uh, at procuring uh, AI or AI software, because if you don't, it will risk disruption to your program. It could result in those anticipated efficiencies not being generated or anticipated savings not being realized. And the way in which you handle that change will be scrutinized you know, both internally and externally with reference to your ESG commitments, your culture, your values within your business. And so it is really important to assess whether the changes that are envisaged may have a disparate impact on different demographics across the workforce, and also consider that broader social and community impact of the changes if it is going to result in something quite substantive in terms of your workforce composition. And then finally, just align that with your longer term recruitment strategies. You know, what is your talent retention plan? What is your plan for upskilling your workforce to work alongside and not just complement, but supplement um, the AI software that you might be introducing uh, at, at, in, into your workplace? Thanks, Gareth. I think one other further consideration um, when it comes to workplace transformation, something something further for employers to think about is if an AI system has day to day control over the work of any of its independent contractors or consultants, are they then at risk of becoming an employee um, for the purposes of employment law and this might might seem like a long way off for traditional employers but the sophistication of AI is growing rapidly and the reality 
for individuals operating in the gig economy, such as Uber and delivery drivers, is that they are already effectively managed by algorithms. However, they aren't treated as employees for employment law purposes in the UK and therefore aren't entitled to most statutory employment rights. So the EU is is looking to address this now um, in its new platform workers directive, which will impact all businesses with workers in the EU. So it's something important for employers to be aware of. If three of the seven criteria outlined in the directive are met in respect of a particular individual, they will be presumed to be an employee and therefore entitled to the applicable employment and social security rights. A few examples of these criteria are, for example, that the platform restricts an individual's ability to accept or refuse tasks, uh, it supervises performance electronically, um, and it restricts the individual's ability to use subcontractors or substitutes. Clearly, a a lot of workers in the gig economy are going to meet these criteria, um, and potentially in the future, more traditional criteria. contractors, consultants um, in other areas of business will also meet these criteria. Um, So it is a significant piece of legislation and it is definitely going to be interesting to see what approach uh, the UK takes um, in response, whether whether this directive impacts um, its, its, um, its approach to employment status going forwards. Thanks, Emily. Food for thought. We've looked at how employers and HR teams are already using AI in the workplace, but what what about where employees are using generative AI to actually carry out their duties and their their tasks in in work? Of, yes, I mean of of course there's there's huge potential benefits in utilising generative AI in the workplace and significant scope for it to automate uh, many daily employee tasks um for example and i think we've all become used to speaking to chatbots when we've got a problem with our heating or our online shopping order so clearly many businesses are already using generative ai particularly in the form of large language models um which is essentially the word for ai systems that predict the next word in a sentence at a very high level um, like chat gpt But um, what are the potential risks of employees using generative AI as part of their roles? Well, firstly, chat GPT and similar large language models can't can't be relied upon for accuracy. Chat GPT is trained on data that was available at 2021, for example. So if you had a legal question, the law had changed since then, then the answer is clearly not going to be correct. Uh, we've certainly had a few clients um, come to us saying that they, you know, they initially asked ChatGPT for the answer to a question before before approaching us, and um, after they suspected that the answer that they were given wasn't right. But um, if an employee were to rely on ChatGPT's response without question, then this could result in false information being published on behalf of the business. And there's also the risk of third-party IP infringement to think about. ChatGPT and similar models don't, don't own the copyright in the information provided. That, that belongs to someone else. And so if an employee reuses the content generated by um, ChatGPT um, in an external publication, then there is a risk of a copyright infringement claim. Another challenge for employers is that ChatGPT uses data input by users to continually train its model. So unless unless the user actively opts out, if an employee inputs confidential information um, into ChatGPT, then this could in the future be disclosed in response to another user's question. <clears throat> another, another more practical consideration in relation to employees using um, Gen AI as part of their roles. If employees are relying on AI to carry out their day-to-day responsibilities, then managers could quickly lose the ability to properly perform and manage them. If they don't know how much of their work has been done by them um, and how much has been created by AI. Similarly, reliance reliance by employees on AI may result in the diminished development of employee skills. Of course, there is question over, you know, if AI is going to dominate our lives going forwards, then, you know, how much does this matter? 
but for employers that are concerned about about these considerations that I've just outlined, what what can they do? And I think the, the number one thing that we would recommend that they do now is to introduce a generative AI policy that clearly sets out the parameters of acceptable use in the workplace. Um, and it, it's certainly something that Bristos has helped a lot of clients with um, already, and I'm sure will continue continue to do so. Thanks, Emily. I think just before we wrap up, it's worth looking at the legislation regulation guidance, which may be introduced to address some of the risks and concerns and issues that we've identified uh, during the course of this session. So, you know, in the UK, there's currently no specific laws that explicitly regulate the use of AI in the workplace context. However, as both Emily and Mark have mentioned, there are a number of areas of both statute and common law that restrict the use of some types of workplace AI in practice. It's both employment legislation, but also data legislation. <clears throat> um, in March of this year, March 2023, the government produced a white paper, um, the glorious title of a pro-innovation approach to AI regulation. Um, that sort of sets out an intention to strike a balance between regulation uh, and innovation. Um, the approach is based on five key principles, safety, transparency, fairness, accountability uh, and contestability. A few of those terms Mark's already mentioned, you know, in the context of talking about uh, protecting data. Um, those key principles, they will initially be non-statutory. So rather than directly integrating the principles into law, the government intends to monitor their effectiveness and potentially develop a model over time. So the white paper certainly suggests at this stage a fairly light to touch approach uh, in the UK in terms of regulation. Um, that said, I think since March, there has been there have been signs that the government's position on AI regulation is shifting towards perhaps a more cautious or risk averse approach. And of course, in any event, with a general election and potential change in government looming, you know, we are still in that sort of watch this space uh, territory. Um, it's worth noting, though, the significant differences at the moment between the UK and the EU approach to AI. You know, the, EU, the EU, they will be introducing legislation, as Emily said, to regulate systems through the AI Act. You know, we've seen them have a marathon negotiation last week uh, where they appear to have settled on the rules that will flow uh, from that Act. And in contrast to the UK's uh, proposed approach of using existing regulators, the EU intends to establish various new regulators, uh, including a central European AI board and national AI authorities in each member state. You know, it intends to take a risk-based approach to AI regulation with four risk tiers, you know, unacceptable, high, limited, and minimal. And systems found to pose an unacceptable risk, so right at the, the top threshold, they will be entirely prohibited. You know, for example, use of CV sorting software for recruitment is considered high risk, while technologies uh, such as using AI algorithms to identify workers' emotions would be classed as unacceptable and therefore prohibited. So this divergence in approach is gonna present challenges for companies which operate across both markets, you know, and it brings us back to that importance of strategic planning at an early stage uh, from both, uh, for, from a broad cross-section of stakeholders in your business, both locally uh, and internationally. Some huge topics uh, there that we've just covered in the last uh, few minutes, um, transformation of the workplace, generative, AI and its use by employees and of course the legislative horizon, both um, legislation in the works and of course case law. This topic is not going away. Uh, we would love to hear your feedback. Uh, we would love to hear questions about things that you uh, want covered. Uh, we will be producing more materials uh, and uh, more podcasts, webinars and the rest of it. Uh, in due course, it remains for me to say thank you very much for listening. Thank you to my fellow speakers, uh, Gareth and Emily. Um, so it's uh, goodbye from Emily. Goodbye. Uh, it's goodbye from Gareth. Goodbye. And it's goodbye from me, Mark. See you next time.